Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming to uh, COVID-19 Borders in the Law, uh, hosted by the Center for Comparative and Public Law at uh, the University of Hong Kong uh, Faculty of Law. Uh, I'm Chris Labla. I'm a Global Academic Fellow here at the Law Faculty, uh, and I'm the organizer of this conference, um, which deals with a number of problems that have arisen with uh, the issue of border closures and restrictions uh, arising from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, many of these not necessarily unprecedented, but which have been reopened or emphasized as a consequence of the pandemic. So for example, uh, tensions between different human rights, rights to movement and rights to health, uh, questions about treaty law, the adequacy, for example, of the international health regulations under the WHO, um, questions that involve interdisciplinary considerations that bear on the law, for example, um, thinking through border restrictions historically or thinking through the political consequences of border restrictions um, and thinking through potentially uh, the impacts of these restrictions on those who move, particularly the most vulnerable of those who move migrants and refugees. And all of the panels in this conference uh, have been organized essentially around uh, these issues, thinking through uh, how we think about human rights and border restrictions, how we think about international law and the consequence of uh, disease control related border restrictions, um, how we think through border restrictions through different disciplinary perspectives, uh, and how we think about the impact on those who uh, move through those borders. Um, this, of course, is an issue that continues to impact us significantly uh, here in Hong Kong, uh, significantly throughout greater China, uh, and throughout East Asia, there is still uh, significant restrictions on visitors into Japan, for example. Um, so it's not just not just here, but it's also something uh, that's worth thinking about prospectively with regard to future pandemics uh, and how we consider uh, how the law impacts on border restrictions uh, and potentially the need for border restrictions at all going forward um, in those pandemics. So with that, um, hopefully not having said uh, too much, I wanna turn it over uh, for an introduction from, from our Dean, uh, at the, the Faculty of Law, uh, Hua Ling Fu. Um, thank you right. for, thank right. you for, for uh, being present, uh, Dean Fu. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so welcome to the uh, conference. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank all the speakers uh, for taking the time to share their knowledge with us. Uh, I understand we came from different time zones, uh, some probably very uh, early in the morning, uh, now we probably uh, have gotten used to um, sort of uh, Zoom meetings and also probably very tired of it. Uh, so I appreciate your uh, contribution. I'm uh, delighted to see uh, many of my uh, colleagues um, participating in this uh, event in different capacities. I said uh, this before, I repeat now, that we are opening our border and hopefully I can stand in front of uh, you know, a real uh, audience in a real classroom to welcome you all to Hong Kong in the uh, near future. Um, I want to thank uh, Professor Yap uh, for his leadership and his team in organizing a wide range of uh, academic activities in the past, uh, past two years the CCPL uh, is, uh, has getting more vibrant, uh, active, in particular in the past two years, uh, 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 sort of in the age of uh, Zoom. Um, in particular, I want to thank Chris for putting this event together. Anyone who organized conferences would know how much time you would have to spend it in organizing everything and putting everything together. So thank you. Uh, COVID-19 has led to waves of travel restrictions and border quarantines, which in turn presented a number of uh, practical challenges and, uh, and the legal problems that will continue to provoke discussions and uh, debate. Um, I am myself is going to Germany tonight. I'm still struggling you know, whether there will be uh, you know, approval of a negative test result or what exactly I need to present at the border. So I, I sort of have, I'm personally experiencing this uh, challenge. Um, hopefully everything would, would, be, uh, would be fun. Um, I think the conference will seek and, uh, to address those um, uh, um, debates uh, and beyond. Uh, 
I wish the conference a, a huge success and uh, look forward to the discussions and uh, presentations. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dean Fu. Um, I just want to turn it over now and maybe we can um, begin um, introducing the presentations uh, uh, from Pojen. Yes, uh, hello. Uh, my name is Pojen Yap. I'm Professor of Law and Director of the Center for Comparative and Public Law. We'll launch quickly to panel one, which is on border restrictions, quarantine, and human rights derogations. So while the world is opening up, I mean, for some of us who are living in Hong Kong, we seem to be in some kind of a limbo, right? So, so my uh, counterpart from Chinese University of Hong Kong may somewhat empathize and sympathize with some of our predicaments. So today we will look at some of the human rights challenges in light of our international law obligations. I would introduce the speakers before they speak so that the bios will be fresh before the audience. So let me go to our first speaker, which is my uh, colleague from across the harbor, uh, uh, Professor Fernando, Fernando Diaz Simo, Chinese University of Hong Kong. And his topic for today is travel restrictions and international freedom of movement. Fernando, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Um, I'm having some, some construction noise in the building. Uh, hopefully uh, it will not affect my, my presentation. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to, to join this, this event, which is, of course, for anyone living on this planet, uh, especially timely. Um, in addition, if you live in Hong Kong, of course, travel restrictions are something that comes up in every uh, conversation. I have been doing some research about this topic for the last two years. They have been personally affecting me, like, like many of us, because uh, scholars, of course, as the Dean mentioned, are used to traveling for conferences and even what, even though some people um, believe that uh, we are all getting used to Zoom, uh, I think we can never really get used to Zoom and it doesn't replace uh, the, the, the conversations that we always have in, in, in face to face events. But anyway, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to um, be discussing very briefly um, how international freedom of movement is regulated um, by international law instruments, namely the international health regulations and human rights treaties, um, focusing on international uh, the international uh, health regulations. I believe that my colleagues will get into uh, more detail when it comes to um, human um, rights treaties. As we all know, um, in early um, 2020, in January, the World Health Organization declared COVID to be a public health emergency of international concern. And this, of course, triggers the application of the international health regulations, an instrument that I'm sure uh, not a lot of people were uh, familiar with before uh, this event. Uh, according to the international health regulations, the, the World Health Organization may issue temporary recommendations. And uh, those temporary recommendations underline that there was no reason for measures that unnecessarily interfere with international travel and trade. This, of course, was in line with the rationale of the International Health Regulations of 2005, which uh, seek to avoid unnecessary interference with international traffic and trade, uh, and with the purpose of temporary recommendations, which is, again, to minimize interference with international traffic. However, the fact is that historically, uh, governments, when they are confronted with a pandemic, they have a knee-jerk reaction of imposing travel restrictions, uh, travel limitations, or even outright uh, travel bans. And this time-honored tradition was taken to uh, unprecedented levels in response to COVID-19. Um, four months after uh, the outbreak, 96% of global destinations have implemented some type of travel restriction. Of course, this would uh, depend on fine-tuning the terminology, but these measures uh, range, uh, ran, uh, ranged essentially from banning passengers coming from certain countries. In the beginning, a limited number of countries where uh, cases have been identified or with specific nationalities, uh, suspension of flights to partial or even complete closure of borders. Uh, nowadays, as has also been mentioned in the introduction, uh, 
most destinations around the world have um, eased or even lifted those travel restrictions. Um, science shows, medical studies show that travel uh, contributes significantly to uh, the propagation of the disease, especially air travel. And in the context of scientific uncertainty, um, it is only natural that governments uh, uh, implement some type of measures to avoid accusations that they are not doing anything. However, contrary to common perception, travel restrictions are not effective, and studies show that at most they delay the peak of a pandemic by a few days to a few weeks. Of course, I'm not a medical doctor, but I have consulted um, the uh, literature and the studies all point in this, uh, in, this, in this direction. In addition, as we all know, uh, these measures have disastrous economic effects. They hamper the flow of, of medical supplies and health workers. And importantly, they affect the rights of migrants and refugees. Um, in a nutshell, and I'm not going to get into detail, uh, the validity of these measures depends on several elements. We need to look into the applicable legal framework. As I mentioned before, the international health regulations and human rights treaties, both uh, sets of rules protect international mobility, uh, but they have different goals and different scopes of application. Starting uh, with international health regulations, they seek to strike this very delicate balance between the protection of public health and the maintenance of international mobility. Um, health measures adopted by states should not be more restrictive of international traffic than reasonably available alternatives. They should be based on scientific principles, available scientific evidence, and any available guidance or advice from the World Health Organization. And if they significantly interfere with international traffic, states um, have to provide the organization with a public health rationale and relevant scientific information. I think it's not very difficult to conclude that most travel restrictions that were implemented breach the international health regulations. I didn't really conduct a study on all of them. That would be impossible. Um, more than 180 countries implementing some type of measure. Uh, and it, that would also depend on, on defining what the travel restriction is. But I'm pretty sure that, for instance, when it comes to uh, travel bans, to just closing the borders to some or all type of people, uh, we are clearly talking about the breach of these rules. Um, in fact, flight bans and the closure of borders are not even mentioned in the international health regulations. And I find it difficult to demonstrate that these measures are supported by scientific evidence. Even if they were, uh, more effective alternatives could have been adopted with less restrictive effects, um, such as screening at ports of entry and exit. I don't really enter into a discussion about quarantine. It's a completely different case. Um, we know from experience how harsh quarantine can be, but at least there's some type of scientific rationale behind it. Uh, this whole idea that by closing borders, you stop the, the virus from coming in, especially when it's inside your borders anyway, um, as happened, for instance, when the United States implemented these measures, when the European Union introduced these measures, the virus was already inside the borders. Um, it's only natural that when we have news of a disease or outbreak, this reduces um, international movement. People voluntarily refrain from traveling. Airlines adjust to the new conditions. However, I believe that measures uh, of this kind imposed by governments are a self-inflicted wound. They only add up to the economic and social disruption. A lot of people got stranded. Um, in the beginning, if you remember, some governments even charted flights to bring them home. Uh, this reveals, in my opinion, a parochial and nationality-based approach to public health. Um, uh, so it's dangerous to open the borders to foreigners, but if it's our, our nationals, we need to rescue them. Uh, these were re repatriation flights. I don't really think that they can ju be justified from a, a public health perspective. Uh, you also have the, the, the case of so many um, migrant workers that got stranded, uh, Filipino community in Hong Kong, for instance. A lot of people could not return to their countries. Others could not return from uh, their countries to Hong Kong. And so they lost their jobs. Uh, a lot of suffering, in my opinion, could have been mitigated. Um, what, in my opinion, as I also argued in another paper, 
uh, all of this reveals is uh, not not just social distancing, but re really a different type of distancing, which is that of states from international law. The problem is that international health regulations um, are not enforceable. The, the temporary recommendations are not binding. And so despite being an international legal document, uh, the international health regulations uh, resemble a soft law uh, document, compliance with which is based on, uh, on, on persuasion. Uh, and countries, of course, still take very seriously their, their sovereignty when it comes to fighting a public health uh, threat. So as we know, for instance, uh, and in the beginning, this was noticeable, several countries uh, approached a very nationalistic uh, approach, for instance, um, blocking the, um, the entrance of certain uh, nationals as, uh, um, as a response to the fact that other countries had done the same regarding their citizens. Turning to, um, turning to international um, human, treaty, uh, human rights treaties, um, of course, uh, as probably my colleagues will discuss in greater detail, uh, the right to freedom of movement is also protected through these instruments, namely the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. It's divided into two different dimensions, the right to leave and the right to return. Um, so the, determining whether travel restrictions and even uh, the extreme case of travel bans are lawful uh, depends on the status of the traveler, namely whether they qualify as nationals, as residents, which are normally treated uh, more or less in the same way, or as something else. Um, in my opinion, as I mentioned before, at least the most extreme type of measures, which are travel bans, seem very hard, if not impossible, to justify. Um, why? Because Entry bans covering nationals and residents are clearly a breach of the right to return. I remember that a few countries did this, Morocco, for instance, for some time. Uh, so they, they, they banned their own citizens from coming back to the country, which is straightforward, uh, illegal, according to, the, uh, according to the International Covenant. Exit bans, uh, which were applied by some nations, I remember Australia doing this, um, are also problematic because they affect the exercise of the right to return. And I mean, in, in, in terms of medical rationale, of scientific rationale, what's the problem of letting people out if the idea is to keep the virus out, not in? Uh, letting them out um, is probably not, not that country's concern. It may be other countries' concern, but not their own concern. The problem is that both types of measures also indirectly uh, prevent family members from uh, exercising their rights to family reunification. Um, I know of several people going through the situation, myself included. Uh, it is also true that foreigners do not have a right to entry a foreign country, uh, but they may not um, be prevented from leaving because again, this may affect their right to return to their home country. Um, the reference to uh, a right to travel or a freedom of travel is well established also in the doctrine. Um, according to the Human Rights Committee, and I quote, liberty of movement is an indispensable condition for the free development of a person. Of course, it is not absolute and it may be limited for public health reasons, but the restrictions should be construed narrowly. I find it, uh, in addition to the requirement of legality, they need to be based on a uh, sound legal uh, framework. They need to pass the tests of necessity, I would call it medical necessity and proportionality. And I have serious doubts that they are justified from a medical point of view. And even if they were, I believe that um, there would, be more proportional measures. Again, I don't discuss whether uh, quarantine is necessary or not. Quarantine already raises its own problems. I'll leave that to my colleagues. Uh, but I believe that simply um, this parochial approach of let's close the border and keep the, the, the disease out doesn't really solve much. Um, it has also paradoxically been demonstrated in studies that were conducted again during COVID that people, the public opinion, um, if you ask them, are you in favor of lockdowns in a certain city, for instance, they oppose lockdowns. So they want the freedom to, to walk around their neighborhood. But if you ask them if they agree with international travel restrictions, most of them do agree with them. 
um, which shows a lot how travel is still considered to be a luxury, which in a globalized world um, is a serious problem. My main conclusion is that we need to translate the pediology into international law. Um, the World Health Organization should also take lawyers more seriously. We have a very developed regime and even an international organization developed um, devoted to protecting international trade, but we don't really have an equivalent when it comes to international travel. We still think that this is something that can be put on pause um, whenever there is an outbreak. Uh, and this has happened several times before with other um, epidemics. Uh, the fact is that they didn't affect the vast majority of the population. And so even though repeatedly academics uh, and experts have been drawing attention to this problem, uh, only now a lot of people and hopefully policymakers are becoming aware that these um, national measures should be coordinated and they should not be imposed against the, the legit artists. They should conform to evidence-based uh, medical knowledge and respects international law. Um, as I mentioned before, I have published three um, articles on the topic. I would be happy to share them with anyone who uh, has an interest. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Fernando. I think many of your concerns and arguments resonate with many of us living in Hong Kong. Now we'll turn to the next time zone, Australia, where Associate Professor Kate Ock will be speaking on live experience of Australia's international and domestic COVID-19 border closures. She's joining us from the Australian National University. As, as we know in Australia, until recently, they had one of the most uh, 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 intensive uh, travel bans that existed in the world. So with that, uh, Kate, uh, you have the floor. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this wonderful panel and conference. So I'm going to share today some ongoing research I'm doing with Associate Professor Olivera Simich from Griffith University. So we're looking at Australia's international and domestic COVID-19 border restrictions, both from legal and socio-legal perspectives. So I've got here, this is just... Um, I should mention, by the way, this is a very new topic for both of us. So my background is refugee law. I'm an international comparative refugee law scholar. Oliveira is a transitional justice scholar, and she in particular has a focus on survivors of wartime sexual violence. So we in no way ever contemplated or expected to be in a position of doing a research project on Australian citizens and residents and their experiences of displacement and border injustice. But we really, um, Oliver and I really connected because we found um, the ways in which uh, Australia was putting restrictions on its own citizens and permanent residents during COVID-19 with respect to travel domestically and internationally. We found this problematic legally, but also normatively and morally as well. And, and also, we were quite stunned by the silence. So the lack of dissent from the broad Australian community about these laws and policies, and also the lack of protest from individuals and organisations ordinarily very much devoted to civil liberties and human rights. So there was silence where we would have expected to see protest and dissent. Um, so as I said, these, these publications are, are for note. This is what um, the, um, the publications we put out um, before we started working together. Um, so I'm going to um, spend the panel um, time talking about the research we're doing together. So just to give you a bit of context, a bit of background, at most times during the pandemic, there were between about 30,000 and 40,000 what have been referred to as stranded Australians. So these are Australian citizens, permanent residents outside the country, wanting to get home but unable to do so. Um, mostly this was because of the imposition of arrival caps. So the federal government uh, placed um, a cap on the numbers of Australians who could arrive in the country in, in any certain week. And the number shifted, but it was usually a few hundred, limited to a few hundred. Um, and this was usually correlated to the availability of hotel quarantine. Um, now, of course, once that happened, fewer flights, 
flights from only certain locations and flights become extraordinarily expensive. So there were tens of thousands of Australians wanting to get home and not able to. In addition to that, as Fernando has already said, there were exit restrictions. So you actually had, to, as an Australian citizen or permanent resident, even if you were a dual national, you actually had to get permission from the Australian government, federal government to leave. You had to provide a compelling reason to leave. And there were stories of even people who were wanting to leave to attend a funeral or to provide essential care for an immediate family member being refused um, that permission. So that was the international um, travel restrictions that were imposed on citizens and permanent residents. Um, Australia is a, a federal, has a federal legal and political system. So states and territories within Australia also implemented their own border, um, border policies. And I'm not going to bore you with the details because there were many and they um, were changed. But essentially what this meant is that some people left their normal place of residence, crossed a state and territory border for you know, legitimate reasons, for example, attending a funeral, and then found themselves unable to return. Uh, so unable to cross back across that state and territory border to um, return to their usual place of residence. Because of this, thousands of Australians across the pandemic in different parts of Australia were actually rendered homeless. Um, we saw people living out of their cars at the, you know, the entrance to the relevant state and territory border. Um, and also a lot of people were unable to cross the state and territory border to access essential and, emerg and, and emergency medical care. So um, with respect to the first, um, the first paper that's mentioned there on the slide, when we started working together, I really wanted to first focus on those who were stranded domestically. And that's because there was already a little bit of research on those who were stranded internationally. So I wanted to think about how does international law inform the situation of those um, who were stranded within Australia? The argument we make is that these um, people are internally displaced persons within the meaning of international law. This is quite a novel and controversial argument in the sense that the overwhelming majority of scholarship, the overwhelming majority of UN um, policy material on IDPs, internally displaced persons, focuses on IDPs in lower and in, in lower and middle income countries there's almost an assumption that there are no IDPs in higher income countries. In fact, for example, if you look at the UNHCR statistics from 2020, they don't list any um, higher income countries as having IDPs. Um, I would argue against that because we saw that in Australia, we had um, horrendous bushfires in 2020 and a lot of people became internally displaced because of them. Um, so I, the article really highlights, I think, the ingenuity of the international legal framework on IDPs, and we show how it can be used to inform the interpretation of domestic human rights legislation to reach quite a, a nuanced and balanced um, legal and policy response. We have this unfortunate dichotomy in Australia of the need to sacrifice freedom of movement pr to protect the right to health. And we show that the IDP guidelines, um, if they're used to inform human rights analysis, actually arrive at a much more sophisticated and nuanced outcome. So this is part of what has been referred to in the literature of the domestification of international IDP law. The last thing I'll say about that paper, I think it really pushes, it opens up a new area of research of drawing the connections, in particular the legal connections between COVID-19 displacement and climate change disaster displacement. So I'm happy to um, talk a little bit about that if people are interested. With respect to the second paper um, on the slide there for you, it's almost ready for submission. We've just got to um, uh, or just tidy it up a little bit. This really emerged um, in particular because of Oliveira's being a transitional justice scholar. Her observation of um, last year, there started to emerge a lot of public accounts, public accounts of displaced Australians, displaced internationally, displaced domestically about their experience. And Oliveira sort of said, this is what I, this is what I hear in my research when I interview um, victims of uh, displaced victims of conflict. And so in this paper, we draw a parallel between the public narratives of Australians who've been displaced because of COVID-19 
border restrictions and the transitional justice scholarship on displacement and particular displacement um, due to wartime and conflict. And we use, um, so there's, there's already emerging um, some research on um, displacement um, and COVID-19 and how that displacement has plunged a lot of people into financial um, poverty, um, has um, led to the onset or exacerbation of health conditions, in particular mental health conditions. But we, um, in this paper, um, take, take those observations further and suggest that what we're seeing is the indication of a deeper national malaise. So we're seeing public accounts of erosion of trust in government, of essential of a, a sense of being betrayed by public authorities, um, a sense of disconnection from fellow Australians, um, and also this sense of no longer having a home. And as I said, there are parallels between these narratives and what we see in transitional justice scholarship on displacement from conflict. So we conclude the paper by arguing that there is a need for some forms of transitional justice mechanisms once the nation emerges from the pandemic and we explore the potential role of a people's inquiry. So that idea of a bottom-up grassroots form of transitional justice to give a sense of justice to people who were affected, um, but also to bring about that sense of national reconciliation and healing. Now, um, what I want to focus on mainly is, is this, this last paper that we're, um, that we're working on. So we have started an empirical project interviewing people affected by Australia's COVID-19 border restrictions at the international and domestic level. So I wanted um, to share with you some preliminary uh, insights from those interviews, but the interviews are um, ongoing. So um, the rest of my presentation, Phoenix, is, is not to be um, up uploaded for um, sort of broader public consumption. So I will leave it there. Um, very much looking forward to your feedback. And in particular, those uh, ideas about connecting these observations to um, two theories. Thank you, Kate. I mean, uh, that was a really fascinating presentation. I, I find Australia and a really, really intriguing uh, a case study because as you've mentioned, it is a liberal democracy, but then the bans we talk about, uh, talk about not is only imposed on foreigners, but this is on citizens. And it's not just entry bans, but also exit bans, which doesn't seem to have much connection with some, any internal spread of COVID. And finally, there's even bans on inter-province travel. So it's really, really extraordinary yeah. for a liberal uh, democracy. Yeah. So and I might come... say, sorry, sorry, just one more comment. I, I, I presented them a little bit like they're separate or dichotomous, but they were all wound up together, all wound up. People were affected by entry, exit, international, domestic as well. So they, you know, really merged together in really problematic ways for a lot of people. So we'll get into the questions later. I, I have a few for you, which is, is very fascinating. But we'll turn to our third speaker. And now we're moving on to our third time zone, Professor Martin Schneider, who's joining us from European Institute uh, in Florence. Uh, Martin, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Good morning. Oh, yes. Good Let night. me just quickly mention your topic, which is uh, a human rights-based approach to stop a pathogen at borders. Yes, thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. I will uh, deal with this in 15 minutes. And as we are on the first panel, I'm, I'm happy to say that I fully agree with what uh, Fernando and Kate have introduced. Very interesting um, points which are relevant for the discussion during these two days. I'm sure that there will be many other panels that come with the human rights compatible solutions. So I'm trying to uh, give a little bit of an inventory, but uh, please don't miss these two days. I'm trying to open the discussion rather than, the, than to close it. Let's, let's, let's formulate it that way. Indeed, uh, uh, there are serious human rights issues related to the border restrictions during COVID. They are about the right 
not to be discriminated against in many forms. Uh, they are about the right to seek asylum, uh, about uh, the right to leave any country, including one's own. Um, they are about violations of privacy rights through excessive surveillance at borders, including biosurveillance. And they are about uh, deprivation of liberty through detention, usually called quarantine in the context of contagious illnesses. And all these uh, actual, real, severe human rights problems, they, they may, be, may, may be taking the form of derogation from human rights treaties, or they are excessive use of as such permissible limitations clauses. It also may be that uh, in some cases, the countries have been acting without a proper legal basis, which by definition makes human rights restrictive measures, human rights violations. And here I, I cannot uh, not remind you of the threat of terrorism, which has caused a similar uh, response in panic, where legality often has been forgotten uh, in the name of expediency in acting in respect of a threat. So I'm saying violations, and we are feeding the pandemic. It's not a zero-sum game between respecting human rights and saving lives. It is that blunt measures uh, that are not being thought through and that are taken in panic they both harm human rights and they harm an effective fight against the pandemic. And I am attributing this to a battle between two, one could say ideological or even religious approaches applying their own dogma. In Europe, there is much of an ideological commitment to freedom of movement per se. It's been elevated into a human right above other rights so that the rational approach to borders has been missing. Countries have been cordoning internally their territory to stop contagion, but international borders within Europe are tre being treated as sacred so that freedom always must prevail. And at the same time, one can say in uh, Asian countries, particularly authoritarian Asian countries, there's been another religion which is based on centuries of millennia old epidemiological wisdom where you protect ultimately the palace of the emperor from foreign bad things, including epidemics, by closing down. And uh, we have seen that uh, the results haven't been good. And I, I want to say that COVID-19 is not over. It will be with us for some time. And therefore, even if it's late in the day, it's not too, too late. I'd like to show you uh, two books where with my colleague Helga Molbeck Stensig, we have been developing a human rights approach to, to measures against COVID, both published by Routledge. This is a volume edited by Morten Kierum and others. That was our work in 2020. And in 2021, another Routledge book, which just came out, we worked further on the model of a human rights approach to combating COVID. Uh, freedom of movement is a human right, but the right to enter a foreign country is not generally a human right. Also, one must say that international borders are one good place, but not the only place to stop the virus. Often borders are good because they have the infrastructure of a checkpoint. Often they are also located at natural barriers where it is possible to uh, control and check the flows of people. But one should not exaggerate the benefits of international borders as places to stop the virus. One could think, where else can we take good measures? Life and health are human rights too. There are positive obligations. And I think it will affect the uh, calculation of necessity and proportionality when we recognize that protecting lives and protecting health weighs quite a lot. So there are good grounds uh, for restricting freedom of movement, which after all is not a non-derogable right and is subject to permissible limitations. The question is, 
what are the weights and balances that need to be measured against, against each other and what is the standard. And I think it's good to think how to relativize the, uh, so the, the role of the international borders by thinking of effective measures anywhere and not only at international borders, because then you fall into the fallacy of a religious or ideological approach of protecting the emperor's palace from the foreign threat. So one should develop a checklist of human rights compatible uh, measures. And that starts with uh, identifying the typical human rights violations that flow from blunt measures at borders. Always uh, secure a legal basis and avoid acting in panic. Always respect the right to seek asylum. Leave an opportunity, effective opportunity, to enter the borders and to present your asylum application. Respect the right to leave. It is a human right to leave any country, including one's own. Also, you must respect the right of citizens and residents for whom the country is their own country in the, in the language of the ICCPR to arrive. Not everybody has a human right to arrive, but citizens and permanent residents who have the own country rationale, they must be allowed to return. Beyond these categories, there's also a right to family life, which calls for reunification be beyond citizens and residents. One should remain cautious concerning surveillance and health data and their use at the borders because it easily leads to privacy violations and discrimination. And discrimination, of course, is broader than a question of surveillance. Think, think through all aspects and all grounds of discrimination when constructing your measures at borders. One should be careful with uh, detention. Quarantine is not excluded, but blunt measures of quarantine, such as automatic quarantine in the form of quarantine hotels for everybody, often nevertheless discriminatory because citizens may be exempt, amount to human rights violations. It is a question of a form of detention, and hence there must be an individual decision which is subject to quick court review. Otherwise, quarantine uh, routine and massive quarantine measures will violate human rights. Above all, I'm speaking in favor of an evidence-based approach. Measure and prove the actual effectiveness of whatever measures you take. Choose minimally intrusive ones, from among, among the equally effective measures and secure the proportionality between the measured benefit obtained and measured intrusion into human rights. So we need to have human rights on both sides of the equation. Protecting life and health weighs a lot, but you have to prove that what you're doing at the borders actually delivers a reduction of contagion and hence reduction in the number of illness, disability and deaths. What are human rights compatible measures that could mitigate the risk of contagion through borders? Uh, I'm sure we will hear more during these two days, but here's a, here's a sample. Um, first, discourage travel not prohibit, but discourage travel, including through open information, that efforts are in place to stop the virus and the country will not compromise its commitment to uh, uh, controlling the epidemic and keep the numbers down. I think this is a permanent or semi-permanent change for us, that uh, there must be a constant message that discourages unnecessary travel. Second point is make travel safe and keep it safe through proper wearing of masks, enforcement of the mask requirements, avoiding congestion. Think how much airport infrastructure has changed as a consequence of terrorism. We need to do the same for contagious illnesses. We must redesign all airports in the world in order to uh, make them contagion safe. Invest in air hygiene, 
uh, at airports, on airplanes, everywhere, including airplanes at the time of uh, embarking and disembarking, which is the most risky moment at the time. This will be a technological challenge for years to come. Uh, and I find it highly problematic. Once again, I call it religious, that European or generally Western countries are so quick to remove mask requirements that it's foolish and will backfire. Pre-travel testing is a non-intrusive non measure which should be make, made uh, easy and routine. Arrival testing is another measure. And if, it, if it's done upon the point of arrival, usually at the airport, it must be either genuinely random or universal applying to everybody, including citizens. We are trying to stop the virus, not people. Quarantine is not excluded, but it must not be universal, it must not be random, it must not be discriminatory. There must be individual evidence-based, indication-based assessment of who may be subject to a doctor's decision of individual quarantine, where there is also possibility of court review. Facilitate contagion prevention. Here's a positive human rights obligation. Uh, hand out masks, hand out tests, help uh, with safe airport transport, is in particular for people who uh, may be carriers of the virus. And finally, what's required is the opposite of panic, patience and persistence. Uh, many of these measures are here to stay. Don't think that they are transitory and will go away. If you think of them as transitory, you don't put enough effort to uh, developing a proper framework for stopping the virus and not stopping people. And this is really my conclusion. Uh, many people would want to move away from COVID-19 and say, let's think about the next pandemic. Let's be uh, better prepared for next time. That's, of course, important, but COVID-19 is not over. It's late now, but it's never too late to start introducing the proper approach to international travel, where borders have their place, but they are not the uh, silver bullet that will solve this. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, uh, for providing us with the European perspective. So we have now traversed three time zones. And uh, we'll go to our discussion.